Good afternoon. Roy Oppenheim here again with Jeff Sherman, my partner. We're here at Zoom at noon, and today we're going to be talking about loss mitigation strategies, lesson learned from the last economic crisis. I want to thank you all for joining us. I, Jeff, what, what week is this? I, I, I'm, I feel like it's, uh, uh, you know, yeah. one of these crazy. That feels like Groundhog Day. What, what, what number is it? It's number 28. Number 28. Well, certainly feels like Groundhog Day. Um, but thank you for joining us as, as usual. If we go to the next slide, as you all know, our firm has been representing folks in South Florida for over 30 years. We were literally in the trenches during the last economic crisis, defending people in foreclosure, doing short sales, modifications, deed and lose, all kinds of workouts, bankruptcies. And today we're going to talk about the lessons learned from over a decade of being involved in the last crisis. This crisis is very different. In some ways it's more complex and in some ways it's affecting us in many, many different ways. And we're gonna address that all today. As usual, this is an interactive process. We ask you to comment, to question, uh, and we will actually take those questions in, in, in the middle and at the end. And uh, this way it, it, it doesn't feel like we're just Jeff and I are having a private conversation or that we're just talking to our, our laptops. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the weekly economic update. I think the big news for this economic update is that uh, Governor DeSantis has announced very recently that the state of Florida will not be able to pay the additional unemployment benefits of $300. It used to be 600 and then it went to 300. Uh, in addition to the state's component of unemployment, which is usually around two or 250. So the, the state is saying that it's running low on, on cash reserves and it cannot contribute the $100 additional in order to match the, the federal government. And so the implications of that is, is that uh, uh, people will be spending less and that people are gonna have to you know, find jobs, find part-time jobs, and they're gonna have to fend more for themselves. It kind of reminds me last time, you may remember this, Jeff, I kept telling everyone that the cavalry wasn't coming. You have to rely on yourself. You have to build your own boat. You have to build your own life raft. And, and this time around, it was a little bit different, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna say the same thing. The cavalry will not be there to bail you out. You're going to have to fashion your own personal bailout. You, you recall those days, Jeff? I recall them vividly. So, uh, you know, there's been some help this time around because no one can vilify uh, people for overextending themselves. No one can vilify the banks for doing something wrong. The villain this time is a collective villain. Uh, it's something we can't see yet. It, it, it's something that, that's affecting all of us in one way or the other. Um, next slide. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the pandemic update because there's a lot, a lot going on and there's a lot of noise. Uh, some of the noise you're not hearing is, is that, um, Apparently, there's just been a, a very scholarly study that has come out, it's been reported now in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times and elsewhere, uh, that people who wear glasses or goggles are at a much lower rate of, of getting the disease, getting the virus. Uh, and the reason for that is if it's truly airborne, regardless of if the CDC says it's six feet or 12 feet, uh, since we know it's airborne, it isn't just because you're touching your face and wiping your, your nose or your mouth, it's because your eyes are constantly receiving these micro droplets from the air. And by wearing glasses, goggles, and shields, you dramatically reduce the amount of likelihood of, 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 of the contagion. And this is absolutely fascinating. You can look it up, you can study it. Uh, but I think this is a very important note uh, for all of us to, to consider. I will keep my glasses on. I was never big on, on um, contact lenses, I must say. Uh, the schools, big issue here, you know, we're seeing Palm Beach is now going back to school and, and we're gonna see how that's gonna work out. Different schools, different colleges around the country have, have seen a different scenario. Some colleges have been able to manage it by reducing the number of students. Places like Princeton went completely virtual at the last minute as did Columbia. Other schools only brought in a quarter or a half of the school. Other state schools and other places are trying to manage it. And, and again, once you bring that many students together, it's really hard to control the desire to be social. Um, the next big issue, and it's both an economic as, as well as a viral issue, is uh, the fact that we're seeing a second wave in a lot of places. Florida is not seeing a second wave. We're still kind of at the end of our first wave, but we're seeing Israel that's in a complete lockdown. We're seeing London that's having issues. We're seeing Spain that's seeing a second wave, and that's going to have a dramatic impact 
on the economy and on, on consumption, maybe not for delivery of home foods and on Amazon, but certainly, again, uh, for those folks who are, are uh, in, in the hospitality uh, business. Jeff, anything to say here? No, I agree. Okay. Um, Did you have a comment to talk slower, Roy? Ah, talk, talk slower. Okay. Well, we have a lot to cover, so you can always play it back, but I will try and talk slower. I apologize. Um, okay. Uh, in terms of Florida, we're still seeing a slight bump from um, from uh, Labor Day, but that's starting now. If we go to the end here, we're seeing the bump up, and now it's already uh, it's starting to come down. But the, the, the graph on the right, Jeff, um, is the one I was looking at in terms of number of deaths. We saw it, a, a spike, and then we're seeing it to come down again. That spike could be attributed to the early part of September uh, um, when, when there was a lot of socializing during, during Labor Day. Uh, we may be surprised again, an unpredictable pandemic takes a terrible toll. Um, again, we're talking about this double dip. And, and if we do have this double dip, uh, in fact, uh, it will have an impact not just on the economy, but probably also on the stock market. And it's all going to depend on how quickly uh, the vaccines are distributed, how they're distributed, and how well they are socially accepted, and, and how the politics play out on the vaccines. It's a terrible thing when, when people are not able to trust uh, things that are being said by certain people or by certain parts of the government, and you have to kind of do your own homework. And, and that's what Zoom at Noon has been all about. We've been trying to give people a clear sense of, of when things were going to get back to normal. Uh, as you all recall, Zoom at Noon used to be an hour because there was just so much information going and we were trying to clarify it. Unfortunately, now, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, there's less information that we need to, to go through, but there's still an unbelievable amount. So uh, this pandemic is, is far from over. And I think we need to now talk about what loss mitigation strategies, what private uh, boats and moats we can build for ourselves to protect ourselves and our family uh, in the months to come. Uh, Jeff, wh when do we think uh, the moratoriums of the foreclosures are going to probably have an impact on the volume of, of, of foreclosures, you think? When will we start seeing foreclosures being filed again? Yeah, yeah. I'm saying the end of Q1 probably of next year. We're going to see it. Potentially, uh, in flux. So the end of end of so we're talking really about another six months, seven months uh, before things really uh, start to push forward, and we'll get a sense of that when our colleagues and friends who are lawyers who used to work for the the large uh, foreclosure mills are brought back, and they'll probably be brought back sixty to ninety, maybe even one hundred and twenty days before they start filing, because it's like a monster that they have to be able to rebuild, and they can't just do it in a day. So they're going to be having conversations with their lenders, with the government. And they'll have a sense. And all that's not going to happen probably till well after the, the election is, is the way uh, most people see it right now. Next, next page. So a million mortgage borrowers fall through COVID-19 safety net. I mean, there are still tons of people for whatever reason aren't getting the forbearances or missing their mortgage payments. Uh, and, and they are ones who, who will be the first to have exposure to, uh, to this crisis. We have a question here. How will the courts deal with the enormity of the foreclosure filings? You know, it's still unclear if there will be this enormity. Uh, we're going to look at some slides here that may suggest that the banks are going to go through other, other processes in trying to clear the, the backload. And so there will be new foreclosures. But the question is, will it be at the magnitude that we saw last time? And I think the, the, the question and answer to that uh, is something that we all have to await. What, what, what's your sense on that, Jeff? I think the courts, I mean, you know, over the past few years have kind of cleared out their dockets. So I think they would be able to handle it again if there was an influx of foreclosure cases. It's just a matter of what, they're, what the banks are going to do to file these new actions and, and how they're going to handle dealing with the borrowers this time around versus last time. And, and as I mentioned last week, it also depends on, on how some of the bailouts are fashioned. Some of these bailouts could be fashioned to people who are underwater, but as we'll see soon, uh, many people are not underwater. They may not be able to make their mortgage payments, but ironically enough, they do have equity in their homes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, status of coronavirus forbearances. So uh, this is in terms of the number of millions. We have almost 3 million people that are still in, in forbearance and they've extended the term. Uh, uh, a few million are performing after forbearance. Uh, a number of people are still in forbearance and they haven't extended. Some have actually decided to pay off their loan, not a, not a, a large number. And now the delinquency is starting to grow after forbearance. But the forbearances go to the end of the year currently. So because of that, 
uh, we really aren't going to get a good picture until forbearance is over to determine how many people are going to become delinquent. In many cases, people who are in forbearance are just uh, having the, the amounts owed uh, piled onto the back of the loan, particularly if there's enough equity. It's almost like a soft second, but a soft second that has equity that would have to get paid off, uh, assuming that prices did not precipitously fall before someone ends up selling their home. Keep going. Someone asked how long uh, was forbearance, and the question is six months. I'll let Jeff answer that. Anywhere from six months up to a year, depending on your lender. Some were just, if you call them up, they just give you an automatic 12 month uh, forbearance. It's, it's kind of crazy that they do that. But uh, yeah, it could be anywhere between six months to a year is the average. Here we have someone asking the, the proverbial question. I own an investment property and my tenant seems to be relying on the moratorias, even though they are still working uh, as a reason for not paying rent. Uh, do landlords like me have any rights? Jeff, I'll throw that at you first. Did we freeze? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, see it I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, unfortunately, there's no real right. I mean, the landlord can still try and evict if they want to, if it's for a reason other than non-payment. The moratorium doesn't prevent it for other for other reasons. So let's say there's a health safety issue or the lease expired at that point, you could still use that as a reason to evict potentially, but if it's for non-payment under the CDC order, you're most likely prevented from filing a, an eviction at this time from them. Right, and the CDC thing is the big thing. I mean, that's a huge thing. If you can, if you, uh, and we went over this in detail and, and those details are on our on our website and on the past Zooms, but if, if you file the appropriate documentation with your landlord and you can prove that you can't pay your rent due to COVID, especially if you're in the hospitality industry or any other industry, uh, the, 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 you know, if you were in the, the, the boating industry in some way, uh, in, in terms of cruise lines, you easily uh, could have a valid reason not to be paying your rent right now. And there's very little a landlord or a judge or the, the, the police are going to do to evict you. And so uh, it puts uh, uh, landlords in a very precarious position and it's very unfortunate. And again, as I indicated, this is effectively an existential event for the small landlord. The large institutional landlords, just like the large cruise lines and the airlines, can get these massive, massive bailouts. They can issue bonds. They can they can restructure their, their debt portfolio. Uh, small mom and pop, more, you know, landowners who are relying on their rent for their for their pension or their retirement are not in that position. So it's so it's a very tough situation. Is this forbearance uh, apply only to federally backed loans? The answer is no. It it applies to to uh, uh, if we're talking about loan forbearances. Uh, yes, the loan forbearances for the most part are, are dealing with with federally backed loans. But if we're talking about rental uh, moratoria, that, that would be a, a different issue. Someone asked Jeff to explain what a forbearance is, if we could do that before we move on. Forbearance is essentially where the bank or your lender would say, listen, we're not going to collect payments for X amount of years, or X amount of months. You still owe that money and they'll either tack it onto the end of the mortgage as like a lump sum balloon payment or at the end of the forbearance period, which was used to happen like when there's a hurricane, uh, especially in Florida, they'd say you, we can put you on forbearance for three months. But at the end of that three months, you have to pay back those three months of mortgage payments. That'd be due and owing at that time. Uh, what's going on around this time, unfortunately, is that they're, a lot of them are adding to the back end of your mortgage. So that's the difference between, uh, there's two different types of forbearances you can have. Uh, there's a question here, I don't know if we can fully answer it. Yeah, hello, if there's an officer of the court visiting the house to inspect, does that trigger any current foreclosure proceeding or is it just a regular procedure? And isn't there a suspension to open cases for now? I, I think uh, whoever's claiming that they're from the court visiting your house is not an officer of the court, and I'd be very dubious about giving them any access. Uh, I'm not sure why uh, that's happening. Uh, it could be some bank inspector or some a third party that the bank has, has brought out, and uh, you, you don't owe them any, any right to uh, uh, inspect your, your property, and I would certainly call a lawyer uh, before providing them any, any access. Uh, uh, million, let's go to the next slide. Millions are house rich. Do we, let, me, let me just go back, Jeff, if we can. Uh, millions are house rich, but cash poor. Wall Street landlords are ready. This is interesting because if, in fact, uh, you're going to have uh, mom and pop landlords out there who, who can't afford to not collect rent, you're going to see um, a high likelihood of institutional uh, buyers of homes become landlords. And I'm not just talking about in terms of hundreds of thousands, but like in Europe, in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of homes uh, that, that big institutions on Wall Street are going to end up. Owning, owning homes. And uh, 
it's a, uh, I think it's just a, a, a scenario that is likely going to occur. It, at the bottom here, it says American Homes for Rent this summer has been one of the country's most active builders. Not only are they building, but they're also uh, buying uh, people's existing homes so they can rent them out. Next. Uh, U.S. homeowner equity in mortgage properties quarterly. So unlike 08 or, or 2010, here, this slide doesn't go back to 08, we're seeing that there wasn't as much equity uh, in people's homes. There's only about $2 trillion. I mean, that's a lot in the aggregate, but overall it's not that much. Compared to now, which is close to five times as much, you now have $10 trillion of equity in people's homes. And that equity is going to be the difference on why uh, this foreclosure crisis or this housing crisis uh, may not be a full foreclosure crisis, but may just be a way to uh, get through this process of, of, of transition from this, this pre-COVID to COVID economy to a post-COVID economy. And so, so there's really three economies here. We had the old, the old normal, which was pre-COVID. Now over these past six or seven months, we've actually developed a new economy. It's kind of a current COVID economy. And I think we're all, all trying to figure out what this post-COVID economy is gonna look like. And I think a few things we know about the post-COVID economy. Number one, ultimately there will be less bailouts. Number two, taxes will go up. And number three, there will be winners and there will be losers. And so when we talk about the K, you're gonna have new companies that are winners. You're gonna have new industries that are gonna be winners. And you're gonna have uh, folks who are just on the wrong side of the K. And, and, and even within industries, you're gonna have winners and losers. Even within lawyers, you're gonna have winners and losers. Lawyers who maybe have been doing foreclosure work may not, in, in fact, the New York Times, I think just did an article, it was the Wall Street Journal, we'll get to it, uh, uh, where they may be on the wrong side of the case. So people are gonna to have to reinvent themselves and figure out uh, how to be on the right side of the case. What's nice is about what we've done in the past and we'll be able to do is we will be able to get people the time they need to figure out a, a holistic strategy to make sure that as we come out of COVID and come out of the COVID economy, they will be on the right side of the cake. And that is probably the most important thing that we as a firm have, have done and will continue to do. Next slide. Hey, Roy, do you want to talk about the K real quick and explain that to our viewers? Sure. So uh, if, you, if it, we've been talking about this for weeks, but the first time we talked about it, I didn't even know what a K economy is. I think it's now very clear that if you, if you look at a letter K, a capital K, you have the right part of the K, the one that goes up. Is, is the part where people are, are doing well, that they're people who stay at home, they're white collar jobs, they're people who, uh, who uh, you know, have stock portfolios, 401k portfolios, and then you have the bottom part of the K, thank you, Jeff, uh, and people who uh, you know, are, are essential workers, people who uh, are being exposed every day, people who um, can't work from home, and, and people who, uh, whose economies or, or, or their industries have been whacked so hard that, that they don't have a job right now. And so the key is, Jeff, if we can go, is, is to take people who are at the bottom of the K, at the, the middle of the K, and try and transition them to the top part of the K. And, and, and the way we do that is by making sure people have a plan, make sure people have time, and make sure that, that people aren't gonna get evicted or foreclosed while they are doing that. Last time around, I've talked about this before, we had people that became paramedics. We had people who became FBI agents. We had people who became police officers. We had people who went who became nurses. We had people who went back to dental school. And we were able to buy people that time so they could, they could re, readjust their, their lives and, and literally uh, reinvent themselves. And so uh, we're gonna have that opportunity. Bankruptcy will be one of the options. We're gonna talk about different ways that we're gonna be able to do this for, for everyone. Next, next page, please. Okay, one more. Okay, percentage of mortgage, uh, mortgaged U.S. homes worth less than their debt quarterly. And again, this is very important why we're suggesting that maybe there won't be this massive foreclosure crisis initially. So percentage of mortgages in U.S. homes worth less than their debt, meaning they're underwater, meaning that their homes are worth less than their mortgage. As a simple example, if your home is worth $150,000 and you have a $200,000 mortgage, you're underwater. And so back in 2010, a quarter of the people had mortgages that, that were higher than the value of their home. Again, so if you had a $300,000 home and you had a $350,000 or $400,000 mortgage, you would be at 25%. If you had a first mortgage at 150 and a second mortgage at 150, that's 300, and your house is only worth 250, you were $50,000 underwater. And that was literally 25% of the housing population of people who owned homes back in 2010. And in 2008, it was probably even higher than that. But, but assume 25%. Now, if we look at it, it's less than four or 5%. Most people who have a mortgage today, who own a home, are not underwater. 
they have sufficient equity that if they sold their house, they could probably pay off the house, pay off the realtors and maybe pay the closing costs. It's possible that they'd either have to come to closing with a few dollars or they just work out the final payments with, with the bank and just owe the bank a few dollars. But it's a different scenario as we sit here today than it was 10 or 12 years ago. And, and we fully weren't aware of these numbers at, un, until as we, we see them now, they, they haven't been popping up. And one of the interesting issues as we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll show why people have equity in their homes. Okay, so percentage of mortgages in forbearance weekly. So a lot of people are in forbearance. Uh, if in fact uh, these forbearances become delinquencies, that, that could change things, but these people still may have equity in their homes. But if we go to another slide, I think it's maybe the next one, Jeff. Uh, no, one more. Okay. For sale inventory of single family homes as a percentage of households quarterly. If we go to 2020, Jeff, right, if you can take the, the arrow, and we look at how few homes are listed right now, and we go back, I, I forgot, 1983, I was just graduating college. I mean, I mean, you're talking about how many years ago? 30, 35, 37. Exactly, right. What, what is it? 37 exactly. 30, 37 years ago, you can see that the inventory is so low. There are so few people who have their homes on the market. If people had their homes on the market at the same level that they did in 83 or in 2010, the reality is prices would precipitously drop. If the prices precipitously drop, people would have less equity in their homes. So in, in a perverse situation, the virus is keeping people at home because where are you gonna, if you sell your home, where are you going? You, you, know, if you have a home, you know, people may want your home, but you want your home too. So you're keeping your home, you have no place to go. There aren't, isn't enough inventory, prices are rising. And that rise in prices is keeping the equity in people's homes, which will allow people eventually to sell their homes. But the question will then be where they go. And that's where the critical issue is for the moratoria on, on, on evictions. We're gonna have to find places for people to move to, acceptable homes that people are gonna move to if they sell their home. And, and so if they can't buy another home, they're certainly gonna to have to rent and they're not gonna be able to rent if everyone is not paying their rent and staying in their home. So the moratoria on evictions is gonna to have to be strategically, in, from a public policy perspective, wedded to uh, the foreclosure process. So that as the foreclosure process starts to grind, we have places for people to go and move to. And um, it's a really tricky situation but as long as inventory is low and prices remain high, there'll be enough equity in people's homes and there will be more options for people than merely a foreclosure. Um, let me see if there's a question here. How does the current homeowner equity compare to 2006? As we are indicating, I mean, the equity is just, is just so much more equity right now. But part of it is because prices may be artificially inflated because of the artificial lack of supply created by the virus. If in fact, this was a norm, normal economy and, and there were more homes on the market, there would be less price competition. People wouldn't be fighting over homes like, like, like they have on prices. I mean, people are offering full price. People are offering above price. I mean, it's, 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 it's insane. Another question out here. So if we have equity in our homes, can't the bank just restructure the loan so that once forbearances are done, we do not have to lose or sell our homes? And, and the answer is that's, that's a wonderful question. And the answer is we think that with proper, proper public policy, with proper incentives from the government, it's conceivable that people could do modifications, they can restructure their loans, or that the government will somehow take the back payments that you haven't made and, and stick it on, on the back so you still owe it, but that you don't owe it now so you don't lose their home. The government, I think, probably doesn't want to artificially increase the amount of inventory that is at play. And in fact, the banks learned this, and that's why the banks weren't constantly going through with their foreclosures when they learned that they were just devaluing their book value of their entire portfolio and the value of their banks if they put too many houses on the market at one time because then the, the homes that they were already holding that they foreclosed that they couldn't sell were dropping in value. And so it's a very, very tricky situation. Next, no jobs, load, loads of debt, COVID upends middle-class family finances. So, so here you have professionals who are on the wrong side of the K and they got to figure out how to reinvent themselves. And this article exactly talks about that. Next slide. Percentage change in total household debt balance adjusted for inflation. So this is very interesting. If we look at the housing debt, which is gray, we're seeing that in fact, uh, the housing debt is not the real culprit in this crisis. What is the real culprit is that student loans have gone up 
400% percentage of change in total household debt balance uh, adjusted for inflation. It's gone up four times the amount uh, compared to, to other debt. And, um, and so ultimately that, that could end up being the 900 pound gorilla in the room. But today we're, we're talking about housing debt and what people are gonna do about it. But the student loan debt is a whole nother issue that, that will have to be addressed at, at, at some point. Um, more questions here, let's see. Um, so if we have equity home, I can't, okay, we did that. If my property has potential damage that is not fixed yet by the association and it could affect the structure, is that an incentive or, or how does it affect the potential modification? That's very in the weeds and we got too many slides to go through. We, we can do that later or you can email us that um, unless you have a quick answer to that, Jeff. No quick answer for that one, yeah. Okay, okay great, okay, next. Okay, so choose your path. We, and we've talked about a number of these issues already and I wanna be very clear. So assuming you don't have equity in your home, and let's, let's assume that's the 5% because I wanna be clear what your options are. Your option's gonna be clearly do a short sale, you could do a foreclosure, you might be able to get a loan modification. And, and if you really want out, you could do a deed in lieu, or you could end up possibly, if necessary, doing a bankruptcy. But that isn't gonna be the majority of people. The majority of people are gonna have equity in their home. And so they're gonna either be able to do a loan modification, they may be able to, they could do a red loan modification, they could do what's behind door number two orange, they could do a refinance, or they can sell the property, but they're gonna probably have to do it quickly and they'll have to do a pink quick sale. Um, which means that you'll have to find realtors or investors who are specifically geared up for people who want to get out of their homes quickly because the, the monthly payment, the monthly obligations, once the moratoria are lifted, are going to strangle them and they just need to get out and they want to get out with whatever equity they possibly can. So I envision just like last time that there will be funds that are created that are going to buy some homes sight unseen, helping people not get all their equity out, but getting enough of their equity out that they can rent a place, get a deposit, you know, pay the first and last in security, or maybe in some cases where there's a, a husband who's on the note, but the wife who isn't, the wife may even have enough money out of the sale to use that equity uh, as a down payment for, uh, for another home. Um, so those, those are gonna be your choices. And I wanna go over each of them just a little bit more carefully. So a loan modification comes from the bank. Uh, you need to demonstrate uh, financial hardship. You have to show that even though you have hardship, you still have the capacity and ability to pay uh, for uh, your loan payments. Usually there's a reduction in interest rates, but interest rates are so low already, I'm not sure how much lower they, they can go. Refinancing is clearly an option, but again, there you need to have very good credit. If you're gonna refinance uh, with uh, a bank or a lender that, that uh, is letting you do so with bad credit, your interest rates are gonna be higher and, and the purpose of refinancing will be, will be diminished. A foreclosure defense will always be available. That's, that's obviously a, a later option. That option will buy you the time and get you the, the necessary breathing space that you're going to need. And we'll be able to analyze and determine uh, if in fact the banks did anything wrong. But, but I will tell you that over the 12 years that we've been doing this, the banks have learned from their mistakes. In some ways, Jeff and I and my, our other colleagues have schooled uh, the banks on, on how to do this right by all the mistakes that they've, they've, they've made over the years. And so to that extent, um, while a foreclosure defense will buy you time, it won't necessarily allow you to stay in your home for, forever. Short sales, again, are going to be big. People think that they're big now, but since people have equity uh, in most of their homes, there aren't that many short sales because one of the definitions of a short sale is you have to be underwater and not have enough equity to pay off the bank. Meaning that if you're gonna sell the home for 200,000 and the bank is only owed 180, you probably have enough to pay the realtor, the doc stamps, the title insurance company and everyone else and, and walk away and it's not a short sale. The deed in lieu is going to be your, your last bastion other than bankruptcy, where you just basically give the bank the keys and you ask them to, to waive uh, a, uh, any deficiency judgment. But in reality, um, we're just not there. As long as inventory remains tight, as long as the prices stay high, we're not gonna see a lot of deed in lieus. We're not gonna see that many short sales for the time being. And the same thing with bankruptcy. You won't need a bankruptcy if in fact you have equity uh, in, in, in your home. Um, I think we have two questions. Jeff, any comments on, on any of these real quick? Uh, no, I mean, I, obviously with the short sales, I think this goes to the question that we have. Um, do you right. feel that there will be an increase in short sales due to hold on foreclosures, meaning if the foreclosure hold is lifted, say in January 2021, will all the foreclosures are on hold, all of a sudden need a solution like a short sale? Uh, I see that as being an option potentially where there may be some short sales out there. Right now, people are probably still holding on because they don't have a place to go to. 
So they may not be wanting to list their house, not knowing what the future holds for them. Uh, but once the foreclosure sales do get reset, I do see probably an influx of people listing their homes for sale, knowing that they may have no other option but to do a short sale. I mean, right now, if you're in foreclosure, and there are some people who are in foreclosure and sales are being deferred, but eventually they're gonna be set, there will be a mini wave of short sales for those foreclosures in the hopper. But for the new homes that go into the hopper, if they're being defended properly, the likelihood is that they will take a year or so. And in that period, the economy will change and there'll be lots of different things that go on and the government will, will enter and have new programs. So you want to buy time. Time is really your friend when you're in foreclosure. I mean, very, you know, it, it, you know people say, oh, I'm increasing, you know, my debt. The reality is at the end of the day, 99% of the time, the extra time that we bought uh, homeowners and families was the most important time in their life so they could restructure and figure things out. And so many things change, usually for the better. And so it was really a, a very positive thing. Are there any more, uh, we're, we're kind of being cut off here, Jeff. Are there any more questions? Because I want to just make one little comment before we, uh, thank you. Okay, great. So uh, one of the things I want to talk to everyone about, if we can go to the next slide, if we can is uh, I wanna say thank you to all of us, for, to all of you for, for supporting uh, both our title company and our law firm through this process. We're gonna to continue to do Zooms at noon, but they're not going to be every week for the next few weeks. Uh, one of the main reasons is, is I'm about to become a grandfather for the first time. And so my bandwidth is going to be a little narrower and I wanna enjoy this very special moment in my life, Ellen's life and our family's life and, and also uh, the rest of the firm. Uh, having said that, we're going to continue to intermittently have live Zooms at noon. And in addition, there will, we will do what we did 12 years ago and I will continue to release these smaller videos that you can watch at your own time uh, and in your own place on, on topics that are very pertinent to what we are talking about today, which is particularly loss mitigation and changes in the law and government programs that are going to support uh, loss mitigation. Uh, having said that, uh, we thank you all for, for your support and we look forward to continuing to see you at Zoom at noon, but it just won't be uh, next Tuesday. And we'll, of course, let everyone know when the next one is. And more importantly, if you have questions that you would like us to address, you can email us anytime and we will answer them either directly and or also in our videos or at the next Zoom at noon. So Godspeed to everyone and may you all stay well and safe. And, uh, and we'll see you uh, all very soon. Jeff, thank you as always for, for your help today.